All right, so we, we will start over and say welcome to <laughs> the Home Museum for our talk with Bob Poor on the uh, Bennington Battlefield locations revealed. So before we begin, I would like to thank some of our sponsors. We have some organizations who, who have been very generous to us. Uh, one of them is Vermont, ARP Vermont. <laughs> just right arrow to the next one. Oh, I think it's just telling you that the lamp is... Uh, yeah, our lamp is apparently running a little low, but uh, so, that's okay. It'll go away. That'll go away. Uh, Vermont Humanities is one of our sponsors. Home Light Investment and BurlingtonCars.com. So, hopefully, those that little message should eventually clear itself. Where I've never seen that one. Oh, it just blinks for a while, then it goes away. It'll go away. Okay, so we'll put we'll. We'll, uh, okay, it looks like we're going to be ready to go here. This is perfect. All right, so um, a couple of things. This is uh, last Monday, August 16th, was the 245th, I believe, if I have the math correct, the 245th anniversary of the Battle of Bennington. Uh, the Green Mountain Boys were joined uh, by other rebel forces. They faced off against the professional British Army near Bennington. This battle was part of a larger Saratoga campaign and contributed to a major Revolutionary War victory, which ultimately led to the successful conclusion of the Revolutionary War. But how did the American rebels near Bennington defeat the strongest and richest army in the world at that time? And that is what Bob is going to tell us all about in a few minutes. So just a couple of things about Bob. He's a Bennington historian and researcher. He has been studying at the Bennington Museum Research Library for many years. He spent five seasons at the Bennington Battlefield uh, Historic Site as an interpreter. His research includes Old Bennington and the Continental Storehouse, the object of the British attack and the Vermont controversy with New York, for which he has led events to mark the Breckenridge standoff in 1771. Now, most of us consider the birthplace of Vermont being 1777 in Windsor, but other folks, especially if you live down in the Bennington area, will look at the, uh, the Breckenridge standoff in 1771 as our first uh, mark of our independence. So, so with this, I'd like you to welcome Bob, and I will get out of the way here. sword here. I don't have a clicker, so I might raise the sword when I want the slide to, uh, to change today. Um, so once again, my name is Bob Hoare. I'm down in Bennington. I've been working at the battlefield for a bunch of years. And one of the things about working at the battlefield is, um, if you guys don't know, the battlefield is at the top of a hill. And that particular location gets all the, gets all the attention. Okay, so one of the things I'm trying to do here today is to tell you about other parts of Bennington battlefield and other areas that had to do with uh, the Battle of Bennington. Um, <coughs> the hero of the Bennington, the Battle of Bennington is John Stark, and there's a uh, statue of John Stark and a statue of Seth Warner near the Bennington Battle Monument. Okay, so I'm going to basically be jumping right into the story of the Battle of Bennington, and it's going to have um, images of uh, paintings of the soldiers in the action. And it's going to show you the locations, like I just said. And it's going to move fairly quickly. It's not going to have every last piece of information um, that there is about the Battle of Bennington. And uh, that will be the first two thirds of my presentation. And then there will be a little bit about the Continental Storehouse and some of the, the information before and after the battle. Okay? So we're just jumping right into the, the Battle of Bennington stuff. Okay. This image is of a professional army in Europe, either the Germans or the Prussians. So I'm giving you a sense of what the Americans would have thought of when they were threatened with invasion by a large European army. So the British had sent 8,000 men, half British, half Germans, uh, also including maybe 400 Native Americans, um, to take Albany, New York. So what they were going to do is they were going to come down from Canada, they would get to Albany, New York, and the, the storyline is that that would split the colonies in two with, with uh, New England being the rebellious part of the, the colonies, 
um, sending troops and materials to the other part. They'd be able to hold the Hudson River and Lake Champlain corridor because in 76 they'd already taken New York City. And if they take Albany, they'd really be cutting off um, New England from the rest of the colonies and perhaps then they would attack New England. Okay? So they're trying to get to Albany, New York. In Albany, New York, there's a Fort Frederick. So I'm showing you the sign of Fort Frederick, and that, that's right where the Albany State House is, and the, and the egg in those large buildings in downtown Albany. So that's the actual place that the British were trying to get. One of those star forts was there. Uh, so they started to run sh uh, short on, of supplies. So let's talk, talk about the campaign really quickly here. So the 8,000 men got to Fort Ticonderoga around the beginning of July and the Americans didn't have enough men to garrison the fort, like they actually did the year before. So this year they only had about 3,500 men facing off against 8,000. So it was really their plan to, to evacuate that fort and not hold the lines. So that's where we get the story of the Battle of Hoverton and the Battle of Fort Anne, because the Americans actually split and retreated in two different directions, and the British uh, eagerly pursued them in, in both directions and, and had engagements with the rear guard of the Americans. Um, so that's taken us through the Battle of Harberton, and the Battle of uh, Bennington is really what's going to happen next. Okay, so we're right on to the Bennington battlefield uh, already. So the Battle of Bennington happened on the 16th, but now we're talking about August 14th. So maybe not everybody knows that the British Army got to the Bennington area, just outside of Bennington in New York, on the 14th. And... Um, this location is in North Hoosick, New York, and it's called the Sandcoik Mill. And that picture is showing the road where that Sandcoik Mill was. The bridge is just to the right, um, and there's a culvert. It, there's a culverted stream that's going over under the road right there. So that skirmish would have happened between the two houses in the picture right there. So on the four, on the 13th, John Stark, hearing that there was a group of invaders on the road sent 200 men under Colonel Gregg to take post at the Sandcoik Mill. And on the morning of the 14th, the advance party of the British Army, the, the um, Tories and the Indians, um, had a skirmish with Gregg's men at this mill. And the story in the storybooks is that the, um, the Americans pulled up the planks to the bridge, and that delayed the British Army. But at the same time, the British Army at this mill were able to achieve some of their objectives because they need supplies. They were able to get 78 barrels of flour and some other supplies at this mill. So then, um, the reason why the Battle of Bennington happened in New York State, you can change the slide, John, yeah. um, is because of the Continental Storehouse. So in Bennington, we had what, what would be like a, a business, uh, a militia supply business that is supplying our troops in the field, supplying the Green Mountain Boys that are up at, more, uh, uh, at um, Mount Independence and at Fort Ticonderoga. Those supplies are coming from Bennington for the most part. And when the British Army attacked the colonies, the Continental Army sent over some agents to Bennington to create another layer of that supply business that would be called the Continental Storehouse. So this is what the British Army is trying to, to um, capture in Bennington, is capture our supplies. That would take them away from us, of course, and it would give the, the British what they needed to continue their invasion towards Bennington because they were halted and they were looking for supplies. So they had sent 1,200 men to Bennington. So. Here's a couple more images of the, the engagement at that bridge. And um, so in addition to the um, supplies in Bennington, Vermont's population had been pushed south by the Burgoyne invasion. Um, so once the uh, Fort Ticonderoga had fell, all of Vermont is, uh, is in consternation, and they're, and they're moving away from the British Army. And in fact, the, um, the Vermont government is ordering them south. They're saying, Come south, do not give aid to the enemy, bring your belongings and your livestock. So this stuff, all these people and these um, supplies are going to all be congregating in Bennington. And this Continental Storehouse really is about the mills and the farms around the Bennington area. So that's why they're trying to keep the British out of town. So there was a skirmish at that first bridge, and the Americans delayed them by pulling up the planks. Then they retreated to another bridge. And this, 
Second bridge is going to be sort of the center of the location of the Battle of Benetton. We call that the um, Wilcox Bridge. So on the 14th, we're still on the 14th, two days before the battle, um, at this skirmish, the Americans, according to John Stark, killed 30 of the enemy, along with two of their enemy, uh, the Indian chiefs. So the, um, we can change the slide again. Um, so the Americans stopped them at this bridge, but the British took um, a hold of that bridge, didn't allow it to be destroyed this time, and they held the, the houses on either side of the bridge. And they had the um, uh, advantageous positions around that bridge, and they dug in. And just here is a, a picture of some of the Tories that may have been there. So the Americans had been sort of pushed back from the bridge, but they stopped this invasion from heading towards Bennington. So the Americans used this house called the Widow Whipple's house. Not that house, but an earlier house in the same location. And there were seven haystacks in the area that were also used by the Americans to slow this British offensive. So Baum was outnumbered, and he sends for reinforcements. So this area right here is the entrance to the Bennington Battlefield Park, and it's probably around that location that Baum had his headquarters and his HQ tent and where he could see most of the battlefield and probably where he wrote his letter. So on the 14th, Colonel Friedrich Baum said, half a mile away behind a height, there's 1,900 Americans, and at times they're building some works. So you can see that he was stopped. His 1,200 men declined to attack the Americans that day, and they started to dig in and they sent for reinforcements. So that's the Battle of Bennington. The irony of the Battle of Bennington is that the British Army that was sent to attack Bennington to take the supplies didn't bring enough men, and they were stopped, and they dug in. So the Battle of Bennington is the Americans attacking the enemy just outside of town. So the Americans are attacking the British who are invading Bennington. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, so Stark, realizing the enemy had the better position there at the bridge, withdrew just inside the Vermont border and put his camp on <clears throat> what we call Harrington Hill in Bennington. <clears throat> and when he, when he attacked on the 16th, there's a famous quote that's written on this um, marker here. It says, there are the red coats and there are ours, or this night Molly Stark sleeps a widow. <laughs> um, <clears throat> next slide. So we're going to jump right into the Battle of Bennington itself now. So, there was a rainy day between that 14th, the, the 14th when they stopped the Americans, and the 16th when the battle happened. So the Americans being very prudent, and their main weapon being musketry, wouldn't attack on a rainy day. Um, but that may have helped them to um, design their attack plan, because they had a very good attack plan for the 16th. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things here. Uh, there was a location on the battlefield, because we're talking about mysteries, that Stark used. And it was only about half a mile away from the, the two British cannon they had brought. They had brought three pound cannon. And those three pounder cannon had blown up Widow Whipple's house. I showed you that picture. And they were also firing at this place called Stark's Hill. So there's a quote by Thomas Mellon that says, John Stark was parading his men around and round a circular hill within view and cannon shot of the enemy. And the, the, the cannons were roaring against the hill. And this was, a, this was lessening the fear of the soldiers of the great guns. But also what he's doing is he's distracting the enemy from this double pincer envelopment encirclement that is his, his, that is his attack plan. So here's our most famous map of the uh, Bennington battlefield done by a uh, English lieutenant, Lieutenant Durnford, who was captured at the Battle of Bennington. Uh, and what it's showing is those uh, breastworks, the, the lines um, where the British had dug in. Here's where the Tories had dug in. Here was that bridge that I said that the Americans stopped them at, and the, the enemy had taken the houses on both sides of the bridge. And this is what we all call the Hessian Hill. So that's really the focus of the Battle of Bennington, is that there was a dismounted cavalry unit, and they had, um, posted themselves up high on this hill, and that was really the object of the Americans' attack, and what most people remember about the Battle of Bennington, and that's where the um, Bennington Battlefield State Historic Site is. So here you can see the Americans attacking those fixed positions. And um, there could be large arrows that are showing the Americans taking long marches to go around the rear of the enemy positions. So some maps show the 
the encirclement using some arrows. What are the lines in the upper right? Go back that one slide. So in the upper right, this is the Hessian Hill. Are you showing, are you talking about the three groups that are attacking Hessian Hill? Oh, is that the Americans attacking? Yeah. So the, that's the Americans attacking the, the, the prominent hill. And what they had really done was send overwhelming numbers to the top of that hill. They'd sort of attack the top of the hill like uh, two to one and overwhelm the top of the hill. So here's just another version of me uh, using a Google map to show all these very um, interesting positions around the battlefield that not as many people are interested in as I am. So on the 14th, when John Stark stopped the British, he had the whole brigade set up on this ridge, which was quite a bit uh, away from that um, bridge position. But there's uh, a lot of people that remembered the brigade being formed up there. Um, and I guess, once again, in the upper right, you can see that there was the Indians were posted out in advance of that Hessian hill and was part of the um, defense of the Hessians um, on that hill so that the Hessians would have been defended by the Indians before the Americans had attacked the Hessians on top of that hill. And here is more of our mysteries of the Bennington battlefield. So that's just a diagram of the top of the hill, Hessian hill, once again. And when I started working at the Bennington Battlefield five years ago, there's absolutely nobody that's going to tell you where the actual breastworks were on the top of the hill. On the top of that hill, there was a 220-yard long log breastworks. So the British, in this case Germans, could shoot behind a protected log wall. And there was a roughly 200 Germans and 20 British marksmen up there. Um, nobody's quite figured out where that thing was archaeologically. But by crunching the maps and by studying the topography, I think I've come up with something that we've all agreed with, and we've rebuilt some of those breastworks. And it was really neat in the reenactment last, last weekend that the soldiers were fighting behind a breastworks that we all sort of agreed were now in the, in the proper place on top of that hill. And so I guess the other thing, just because I have a wonderful audience here, is that when people would get to the, uh, the Bennington battlefield on the top of that hill, they wouldn't look in this direction from whence the attack came. They would look in the opposite direction towards Bennington and, and look for the monument. So I feel like now people are, are oriented <laughs> towards looking for the battle uh, location. Can you just from now and show which way Yeah, no, go back to the last slide. So Bennington is actually down in this direction. And when they built the park, all these trees were not there. It was, uh, it was a, a farm field up there. And so the park actually included this wonderful view of the, the monument. And so as it sort of disappeared in the last generation, you still have people sort of looking for that monument quite a bit. Yeah. OK, so now we're just going to jump right into some action here. So back at the top of the hill, the dismounted German cavalrymen, they were the foes. And there's a picture of that log wall that I described that we had just rebuilt, and there's some signs corresponding to the attacks there where New Hampshireman Nichols, that sign, that's where they attacked. And there's also a sign for the uh, Herrick's Rangers, the Vermont troops, where they attacked, as you know. So the natives, the, the 100 Kanawake Mohawk Indians, retreated before the battle happened. So realizing they were being encircled, remember I was trying to explain that there was an encirclement and an overwhelming number of men set there. They realized that they were in trouble. And the story is that they retreated from the battlefield area and took some of their horses that were already loaded with baggage um, and left for Canada directly from the battlefield. But my research and some of us have figured out that some of the Indians actually went and tried to hasten those reinforcements. So I remember the so remember these Germans, they've dug in and they're they're expecting some help. So more Germans to come and help them fight the Americans. Next slide. Okay, so here's the big um, attack on the top of the hill. So when the when the Indians had retreated from the top of the hill, the Germans had two three-pounder cannons with them. And these are very small, mobile, you know, lightweight cannons. And they can respond to battlefield action. So what actually happened was one of those two cannons that were down at the bridge was quickly brought up to the top of this hill to help replace the, the loss that the Germans had of their Indian helpers. So the Americans assaulted the cap, 
the cavalry in their one cannon on this hilltop. There was probably just a few volleys fired. The Americans are firing behind trees. They're slowly sneaking up on the Germans. The Germans are armed with um, carbines. So carbines are short muskets. So they're not going to have quite the length or the accuracy of the American muskets. So that's also going to be a factor there. But we do think that the Americans, just like this painting, this is a painting of the Battle of Bennington by Don Troiani, um, came in up over that breastworks, and the Germans would have defended themselves very well with their saber swords and their hand-to-hand -hand combat weapons. So meanwhile, down at that bridge that I was talking about, John Stark and, and the old men and boys attacked across the river against that second cannon by Beardsley's house. So here is the first time in the Revolutionary War that American patriots are attacking point-blank fixed artillery positions. And this painting is great. So it shows John Stark rushing right against a cannon there. The cannon seems to be defended by redcoats. There were 50 British redcoats at the Battle of Bennington, and they were at the bridge position. None of them returned to um, the British Army except their commander. They were all wiped out. But the British um, cavalrymen at the Battle of Bennington were Germans. So I just thought I'd point that out. So meanwhile, the Tories, who were up in their own position just across the bridge, were attacked. And their position was spoiled because Colonel Stafford from Massachusetts found a little ravine. And he popped up with 50 men behind the Tory readout's position. Um, and that caused the Tories to only um, get off a couple of shots fired at the Battle of Bennington. This painting is not of one of the Tories. The Tories didn't have uniforms, and the Tories weren't all armed. So at the Battle of Bennington, there was 300 Loyalist Americans, or what we call Tories. Many of them were there to help with the 1,400 horses that the British had hoped to get from southern Vermont, and the, and the hundreds of beef cattle, and to, to drive all that stuff back to the British Army. They didn't all have guns, so only half of these um, defenders have guns, so that's why they're going to uh, retreat when the firing begins. And this painting is not of a Tory, it's of one of the Germans, a German Jaeger soldier. Mm -hmm. So the Germans, as a brigade, retreated from the top of the hill, and when they got down to the, to the plains, because they retreated back down to the Beardsley House, um, that's when the hand-to-hand -hand fighting is going to really commence. Thank you, John. Um, here's a great painting by Don Troiani. It's very new, and it shows Colonel Baum with a sword there um, giving the orders to the Hessian Brigade, or the Brunswick Brigade, sorry about that, to um, put away their carbines and to use their saber swords to cut through the Americans. So things are getting desperate, and they don't have time to, to volley fire anymore. They're about to be captured. And we know from some of the first-hand accounts that this is what happened. So you see uh, Colonel Baum is issuing the order while his drummer beats a certain drum beat that actually tells all the men far and wide what to do. Go ahead, put down your guns and break out your swords. And we think it's at this moment, perhaps when Baum identified himself as the leader by giving this order, that Baum was actually shot. Question? On the previous picture, can you go back to the previous one, please? What's the uniform in the top center that's different from the Germans? Uh, so the German drummers wore like an alternate uniform. The one leaning against the tree? Uh, uh, At the top. I don't quite see the one. <coughs> Is it another uniform guy? Just the right of the strong sword. Right in the middle. So I think so. He, you're right. So that is a slightly different version of one of the German brigades. So each each um, brigade has its own um, variations with the um, accent colors. So that actually looks closer to a German. There's two different types of Germans there. Okay. You have the German dragoons that were the dismounted cavalrymen, and you had the German um, grenadiers. So I guess I'll just not say which one is which. And the Jaegers were light cavalry? The Jaegers were just hunters, and they were um, riflemen, and they had short-barreled rifles. Yep. OK, next slide. So Stark captured 700 out of 1,200 soldiers in the first battle out in the fields behind the Beardsley House. 
So the maps of the Battle of Bennington, like that one over there, shows where the brigade was captured behind the Beardsley House. And I think it actually required the Wulumsack River to capture this German brigade. I think they just kept retreating and retreating, and the Americans were surrounding them. They probably weren't very happy about having to capture these Germans and shoot them at point blank. And it wasn't until they, the river became an obstacle that it, the Americans were able to round up these um, enemy soldiers. So less than an hour later, after they've captured the two cannon and 700 out of 1,200 men, and they're dealing with all these prisoners, and they're trying to bring them back to Bennington, they hear the sounds of two more cannon down the road. They hear the sounds of another German brigade. They hear Lutheran hymns, and they hear the, the sounds of the drummers beating away. The second brigade had 14 drummers. The first brigade only had seven drummers. So imagine the racket that this reinforcement group is actually intentionally trying to make so that they can have less resistance as they enter this battlefield area here. Certainly stragglers from the first battle had said, hey, everybody's getting captured down the road. You need to push forward and, and, and change this battle. Perhaps we can still win this thing. So the, the Americans at the same time, they had, I think I forgot to tell you, that the Americans had 2,000 men at the Battle of Bennington at the first engagement, while the enemy had 1,200 men. So that's why they won. They had quite a few more. So uh, I would say, because I'm the only one that's been putting these sort of uh, facts together, that maybe 1,000 of the Americans didn't even fight in that second engagement for all sorts of reasons. Many of the reasons being they had 700 Germans or prisoners to, to march towards back towards Bennington. So it's taking a while for the Americans to put out some, some resistance of this 650 just Germans coming down the road with two larger cannons. <clears throat> so this is where the second engagement happened. So there's a marker, and you see that little turn in the road there where that marker is? There's actually a hill and a ridge top that helped to stop the the Germans coming down that road. So a natural uh, defensive position that some of us call the Rock Ridge. And it says on that marker there that that's where Seth, Mortar's, Seth Warner's men um, came into the action. So Seth Warner was at the Battle of Bennington. He was in Bennington with John Stark at the Catamount Tavern, helping everybody um, organize the battle and to design the attack plan that day. But his men were still actually marching down from, from Manchester. So some histories of the Battle of Bennington uh, don't tell the Seth Warner story quite right. So his reinforcements showed up in time to be the, the, some of the first men in the field for the second engagement of the Battle of Bennington. And here's a, one of the old maps of Hoosick, New York. And it shows that you know, in, the, in the ground there, the, in the foreground, Bennington Battleground, a lot of the people in um, Hoosick remember events having to do with the second battle. Because the second battle, even though it's um, more or less unknown to historians, locals have lots of stories about how their houses were used in the second battle, or finding artifacts in their backyards of the second battle. So the Germans fought their way from that same sand quite mill, which is back down here, a couple of miles back to the, to the first battle's um, location. So that's why the second battle field is all around North Hoosick in today's Route 67. So basically the Americans were, here's a, here's a painting of the Hessnau cannoners. And in the second battle, they had two six pound cannon. In the first battle, they had three pound cannon. Um, next slide. So the Americans were, were trading ground for time. So they're probably just retreating, you know, uh, farm field, the farm field, letting the Germans move towards the battlefield while they were um, organizing themselves and bringing up more men. And a final stand would occur near this house. Here's another painting of some of the German troops that would have been at the Battle of Bennington. Um, and that house there says Walloonsack above the front door on that lintel right there. And um, long before the, the field of archaeology was ever invented, um, Mr. Clark, who lived on that farm there, had found quite a few six-pound cannonballs on his farm. Mm -hmm. So it would be really great if we could find them today through today's archaeological methods. But it's been proved in the past that this, his house was the, the location of the final stand of the, of the Battle of Bennington. One more slide. 
So after success, successfully advancing, so the Germans really did push the Americans out of the way for almost two miles um, before the Americans got enough troops in the field to stop them. So let me throw some numbers at you here. So 650 German reinforcements, themselves maybe only reinforced by 100 men from that first battle, end up fighting the Americans to a standoff. And the Americans probably only put about 1,000 men in the field. So 850 versus 1,000, those are my numbers. Uh, and like this painting, this is actually not a painting of the Battle of Benetton. Some of these paintings are not of the Battle of Benetton. Uh, most of them are. Shows them fighting, you know, a couple of, uh, the, the men are defending some tree lines, sort of in the forest, in the woods. So I sort of like this painting for that. And it shows the men sort of uh, fighting towards darkness, okay? So here's the fun part about the Battle of Bennington. Why were the, was Bremen, the reinforcement group, late to come to the, to the to aid of Colonel Baum? Because he was. He was late by about an hour. So the first thing that the storybooks talk about is how um, Colonel Bremen had formed up his men and, and, and disciplined them on the march and had kept order despite you know, the, the muddy trails and the, and, the, and the rain and the fact that the Indian guide lost the, the way, the German leader, despite all that, continued to be very much a disciplinarian, considering the fact that he's trying to save somebody in the wilderness from being um, defeated in battle. They actually left very late, so Colonel Baum, the, the, fir the guy in the first battle, he had left um, at 5 o'clock in the morning. But Colonel Brayman didn't leave until 9 o'clock. But the orders had gotten the night gotten to the camp the night before. Well, it doesn't seem that the German and the English general were getting along. And the German general had some animosities about how his troops were being used in this engagement. So some people will point to that. But my research has also pointed out, if you didn't know, that German General Riedesel's wife Frederick Baron Frederick von Riedesel had actually showed up that very same day at the British camp. So can you imagine Adjutant O'Connell going to the German general's tent late at night saying, we need to fill out some orders so that the troops can march in the morning, and uh, Friedrich Riedesel saying, well, maybe I'm a little busy right now with my wife and children. So <laughs> one factor for Burgoyne being late, I mean, Brayman being late. Brayman said that he did not hear the sounds of the first battle. So this is part of the confusion. So all this cannon fire, all thousands of troops. He gets within two miles away to that bridge. And he says, I couldn't hear you know, the, the troops. And, and, and I didn't know that I needed to move any faster at that point. So if you all do study the, the stories of the Battle of Bennington, it is very interesting why Brayman doesn't show up on time. He was actually marching towards Hubberton, Battle of Hubberton, and didn't get there on time to participate in the Battle of Hubberton. And if you guys happen to be fans of the Battles of Saratoga, the Second Battle of Saratoga ends at the Bremen Redoubt, where Bremen is attacked by Benedict Arnold, and Benedict Arnold is, is shot, as we know. But what happened, according to myth and legend, is that Bremen was, was, was uh, killing his own troops when they were trying to retreat, and therefore Bremen was killed by his own troops at the Second Battle of Saratoga. So was Brayman the, the, well, was he too professional to be an officer in the, in the German army? Was he, maybe he was better suited to be a, a, a sergeant and not a colonel. So 450 captured soldiers were in Bennington by nightfall. So the Council of Safety in Bennington says, at 6 o'clock, the 450 troops have just arrived in town. And according to most of the sources of the Battle of Bennington, the battle began precisely at 3 o'clock. So within three hours, they have a battle. They capture hundreds of men, and they march them eight miles into Old Bennington. So that gives you an idea how quick that, at least that first engagement happened. And here's one of our paintings of the Battle of Bennington showing the long lines of prisoners heading towards Bennington. And that's the two wounded commanders being brought into the house where they would die the next day. So once again, Colonel Baum and the Tories, the local Tory commander from Husik, um, Francis Fister, were buried in Shaftesbury by the river, and that's the marker there. 
and that's uh, a picture of the first meeting house in Bennington. Bennington was settled by um, religious freedom seekers, so New Light Congregationalist Christians that were sort of breaking away from the Puritan church and the Congregational church were looking for um, better op economic opportunities and places where they could wor worship freely and places where they didn't have to pay taxes to the Congregational church. And that was really the beginning of Bennington, and that's their church. And you can see that same church there in the painting, um, and that's a painting that's showing the prisoners that were in Bennington. The prisoners were in Bennington for a couple of days. They were actually led down to, to Boston to be further in captivity by Paul Revere, who came up to Bennington. Um, this painting shows some Indians right there in the center. So many people have said, did the Patriots have Indians at the Battle of Bennington? Uh, well, we've never really figured that out until recently. So they did not have any Indians at the Battle of Bennington. Um, some of the Stockbridge Mohawk, I mean Mohican Indians, sorry about that, um, marched and got to, got to the battlefield too late. So quite a few tr um, troops marched to uh, many battles and, and got to those battles late. So the Indians would have helped with the prisoners in Bennington. So the soldiers who died of their wounds after the battle are buried in Old Bennington. So in ben Old Bennington, of course, they would have had a hospital, and that hospital would have continued through the battles of Saratoga, wounded from the battles of men from the battles of Saratoga were sent to Bennington for care. So I think there's 15 or 20 men from on both sides that are buried in sort of a common grave in um, the Bennington Center Cemetery. The troops, the soldiers who died at the battle, in the battle, are buried on the battlefield in mass graves. Yeah. Next slide. So here's one of the main questions about the Battle of Bennington. Was Ethan Allen at the Battle of Bennington? Well, he had actually been captured a couple of months after he took Fort Ticonderoga in 75, and he returned from captivity to Bennington in the spring of 78. So he was not at the battle. He was um, in captivity by the British, and he wrote two of the top five books of the Revolutionary War period. His book, Reason Oracle of Man, was a deist volume that was of similar, uh, similar thinking to many of the founding fathers' thinking. And his book about his captivity, it was, um, was an important book for the um, legacy of prisoner of wars, for, for prisoner of wars um, for a long time, and helped to change the, the treatment of the prisoners not only in the Revolutionary War, but thereafter. So the Continental Storehouse, that was the object of the British attack, that's what the Bennington Battle Monument um, marks. And you can see on this little diagram here that actually there had been a further marker noting quite precisely where that storehouse had been. The storehouse was started by John Fassett. He was the militia, militia leader, um, the captain in the militia, so he also seems to have been the commissary for their supply efforts. The, if you've been to Bennington, um, this is Monument Avenue. And Monument Avenue used to you know, just carry right through where the monument is now. That's, that's, that was Route 7 back in the day. So they removed, they discontinued the road when they built the monument and created that circle. But the, the road, going through the monument circle area, which had been lined by houses, was the parade grounds for the troops in the Revolutionary War. So that's where they would muster, and that's where they would train, is also, is also here in um, Old Bennington. So the storehouse, most importantly, um, was a storehouse of, of livestock. So the British army, like any army, was happy to fight in the field as long as they had beef and flour. And what they really needed in Bennington was supplies for their army, beef and flour, but they also needed horses, and they had that in Bennington. And we have a journal of the Continental Storehouse made by Isaac Ticknor, who is the Continental, who's the Continental Army officer who sent over to Bennington to gather those supplies and forward them per orders to the main army. And in his journal, I've made the estimate that in Bennington there would have been seven or eight hundred uh, beef cattle and three or four hundred horses. So there really were all those supplies in Bennington. <clears throat> okay, so we're, we're 
we were done with the Battle of Bennington, and we're still mopping up some of our stories of the Battle of Bennington. So it's Ira Allen who requested the help from other states, not just New Hampshire. Um, and that's uh, what resulted in John Stark and 1,500 New Hampshire men being sent to, uh, to Bennington. And that's what stopped the British. So the British were sent to Bennington thinking that three or 400 men were defending this continental storehouse. No problem. Let's send 1,200 men, and we'll take that thing. Well, they didn't realize until they got to the battlefield area. I already explained that to you, that there was 1,900 men there instead. And the difference was, was John Stark. So there's the Ira Allen house in Sunderland, Vermont. Um, surely Ira would have visited his house as he um, retreated himself from the British invasion and went down to Bennington. And there's the marker in Charleston, New Hampshire for the for John Stark's expedition to Bennington. If you haven't been to uh, Fort Number 4 in Charleston, it's a log picket fort of, of vertical logs, not horizontal logs. And it's, uh, it's a very active um, history site, and they have great events on the weekends. OK, here's a painting of Colonel Baum on his way to Bennington. He's actually at the house that's famous in Bennington because it's painted by Grandma Moses as the checkered house. If you've ever seen that checkered house painting, it's actually the same house that Colonel Baum had used for his headquarters when he was in um, Cambridge on his way to, to Bennington. And it seems like some sort of irony, but I think that the Germans did like sauerkraut and such things, and we have, Ger we have the commander standing in a cabbage patch there. Um, and it's really neat to do the, what we call the Baum Trail. So Colonel Baum left from Fort Miller on the 10th to, to um, attack Bennington. And there's, uh, I think, maybe eight markers along the way for the various campsites that he had. Um, there was one day that got spoiled. They thought they were going to be attacked, and Baum ran up onto a hillside, and they all encamped there for the night. So I mean, just imagine what it would be like to be a, an army in the wilderness with little communication and uh, being easily frightened. Next slide. Okay, so Baum was sent to Bennington, and these are some of his orders. And I think they help to, to explain what's going on here. So here's Don Troiani's painting of British General Johnny Burgoyne. And Johnny Burgoyne uh, issued a manifesto to the inhabitants. He basically uh, threatens the inhabitants of North America. I have but to give stretch to the Indian forces under my direction, and they amount to thousands to overtake the hardened enemies of great America of Great Britain and America, I consider the same wherever they lurk. So unlike General Howe in the middle colonies down in New York and New Jersey, who didn't use the, the Native Americans, um, it was this particular army's desire to use Native Americans against the colonists. The object of your expedition is to mount Raid Redazel's Dragoon. So not only did they not have horses for their cavalrymen, but German General Redazel was asked, actually a cavalry officer, and so was John Burgoyne. So the history books might discount whether or not the British needed a cavalry um, on this campaign. In the Southern campaign, we know about uh, General, Do we know about <coughs> Bannistray Tarleton's loyalist um, cavalry was very effective. So I think if the British had a mounted cavalry unit, that cavalry unit itself could have taken Bennington. Um, the Walloom Sack Tavern in Bennington was originally the Dewey Tavern. And, then, and um, Elijah Dewey was probably the, the person who, was, um, who would have had the horses for the British. So that's why I'm showing the Walloom Sack Tavern. Next slide. So this is a painting of the um, the bottom house in Shaftesbury. The object of your expedition is to complete Peter's Loyalist Corps. So John Peters was from northern Vermont. He was from Fremont, somewhere around Newbury. And he had his own corps of Loyalists. And they were at the Battle of Bennington, but they weren't completed. And so they were trying to recruit more men for his corps. One of the most famous Loyalists in the Revolutionary War um, in Vermont is Justice Sherwood. Justice Sherwood's um, wife, Sarah Bottom, lived at that house. Justice Sherwood, on the 13th, three days before the Battle of Bennington, came over to visit Sarah 
and to reconfirm the information that they had about how Bennington was being defended, and green-lighted the attack on Bennington, thinking that Bennington was defended by three or 400 men. But John Stark had been in Bennington, and he had already marched down that road and was already in Bennington. So what a lark! How does it happen that Justice Sherwood is credited with the intelligence for the Battle of Bennington, which was wrong, and he actually went there on the 13th, and the people who are living in that very house must have seen John Stark's brigade marked down that very road several days before. So we would have some pretty good patriots in this area that kept that information from Justice Sherwood on the 13th that could have upset the victory of the Battle of Bennington. Next slide. Um, your parties are likewise to bring in wagons and other convenient carriages with as many drag oxen. This part of this building right here is the Benjamin Fay carriage shop, and that was probably located somewhere on Monument Circle and relocated to that area there. So the British were looking for quite a few horses, and they were looking for the saddles and the bridles and all the things that went along with that. The object of your expedition is to obtain large supplies of cattle and horses. Well, I haven't quite finished this research yet, but Stephen Hopkins is one of the providers of cattle to the Continental Storehouse. And it turns out that there is a Hopkins in Bennington that had a large stretch of land that is known as, a, as a, one of our early cattle farms and is still a, a cattle area in Bennington. The object of your expedition is to disc concert the councils of the enemy. So if you people don't know, this is the um, Catamount Tavern in Bennington, also sometimes called the Green Mountain Tavern. It's the Fay Tavern. So originally it's, it's Jonas Fay's Tavern, Stephen Fay's Tavern. Stephen Fay's Tavern. And um, now there's a bronze catamount in front of this tavern. And the bronze cat catamount has to do with the controversy between New Hampshire and Vermont over the land, New Hampshire and New York over the land that became Vermont. And the catamount symbolizes the Vermonters' resistance to New York. Uh, so, Vermont's, um, Vermont's government, in the face of the invasion, created a board of war. And the board of war is really what Vermont's government was in 1777. So when you read the Council of, uh, when you read Vermont's early um, papers, it's all about them prosecuting the war and dealing with the prisoners and running that hospital in Bennington. And they're doing most of this work from the Catamount Tavern. So this would be Ira Allen, Thomas Chittenden, and Jonas Fay are the three names that are issuing all the orders that, are, that um, orchestrated the defense of Bennington um, and the defense of the population of Vermont. All persons acting in committee or any officers under the directions of Congress, either civil or military, are to be made prisoners. So what would have happened if the British had broken their way into Bennington? Well, we probably wouldn't hear any more about Thomas Chittenden, Ira Allen, or the Fay family. Next. The object of your expedition is to try the affections of the country. So once again, we're just talking about the loyalists. And I'm showing some of the mills in North Bennington. Next slide. And those millstones right there were from Haviland's mill. So Joseph Haviland was a Tory. And a month before the Battle of Bennington, he went over to the British. And he said to the British, I will supply you with X, Y, and Z when you get to Bennington. When he got back to Bennington, he was, he was arrested by our Committee of Safety. Um, but those are the millstones for the, the mill that had once stood in that very same location. And the millstones ground the grain specifically for Seth Warner's troops. Seth Warner's troops that fought in that second battle came through Bennington and camped near that mill and were fed um, at that mill that day. So, the Battle of Bennington. 8,000 men are trying to get to Albany from Canada. They lose 1,000 of those men trying to resupply themselves in Bennington. They lost a month of time. The first of the battles of Saratoga is September 19th. The second is October 7th, okay? So they lost the time because they had to gather the supplies that they needed to move forward in other ways. So they lost their initiative as well at that time. 
and they also lost the best battleground um, between Albany and Canada, which is where the Americans set up, which was Bemis Heights. So the Americans set up their cannon battery in a position that was better than Fort Ticonderoga or Mount Defiance, and that's Bemis Heights. So the British don't even attack down the road along the river because that cannon, cannon battery prevented them for, from doing so. The, the loss of time that the Battle of Bennington created gave the Americans time to get more troops in the battle, on the battlefield. So I told you at, the, at Fort Ticonderoga, it's 8,000 versus 3,500. Well, it worked out better in the end for the Americans because at the battles of Saratoga, they have equal numbers, and they're going to win these battles. Well, technically, the first one's a British victory, but we'll rush over that. Um, but because they're not moving any further, it's not a tactical victory. Um, so, and the, Brit and the British are starving at the battles of Saratoga, and that's because of the Battle of Bennington. So, um, after the defeat of the British at Saratoga, it's the first time in world history that a British army surrendered in the field. Then in the winter of 77, that's when France entered the Revolutionary War on our side, and it went from being a civil war or a revolutionary war to being a world war, because we, all, we would also have aid from Holland and Spain. And the Revolutionary War would turn, for the most part, to the southern colonies. The major battles in the north were, were won. And it was all over because of the battles of Bennington and Saratoga. Questions? Well, I just want to make a point. The, um, when the Ben Franklin negotiated with the French to bring them into the, into the, uh, into the battle against uh, the British, um, does anybody know the French foreign minister's name that Benjamin Franklin negotiated with? Bridgens? Bridgens, Vermont, is named after him. Awesome. At the, at the same time, the British were offering the Americans everything short of independence. So the battles of Saratoga and Bennington could have won the war with the British as well. Can you elaborate for us everything? Yeah, well, they were, gonna, they were willing to, to stop the war and to, to return to the peace table. Yeah. They thought, the British really thought that in 77 they were going to win the war. So that's why... Um, they were a little reckless with their coordination because they had General Howe that could have come up and helped at, at Albany. They, they figured that wasn't needed. So in the Revolutionary War, there was a, in the middle colonies, um, Howe had taken New York City, New Jersey, and then went and took Philadelphia that summer instead of heading north to perhaps help Burgoyne on this campaign because he didn't think Burgoyne was going to need it. Um, I wonder about your perspective. At the beginning, we heard, well, we all heard, that the British Army was the most powerful, uh, best army in the world against yeah. this militia. All these mistakes were made. You know, the, they didn't have enough troops. The, uh, the they didn't have the right rifles. They didn't have horses. Their intelligence was faulty. Do you have a perspective on how the hell this happened? That that uh, all these mistakes were made by supposedly professional soldiers and to the height of command versus this ragtag bunch of militia. Geez, well, that's a great question. Well, some of the answers are that um, they left Canada without really being fully supplied. So they sort of hedged their bets in the beginning by kind of saying, well, we think our supplies and things like that will catch up. Um, I didn't mention that this very same army, the, the 8,000-man army, had actually come down the lakes the year before in 1776, and had only gotten as far as Falcor Island, and they've just seen Fort Ticonderoga, okay? So Fort Ticonderoga was properly defended the year before, and the British decided not to attack the fort, and also because it was late in the year. Um, so so the, the surprise was lost, and the commander in 76 was Carleton. And when they appointed Burgoyne to be the commander the next year, uh, not everybody liked that. So Carleton didn't really didn't help Burgoyne's invasion as much as he could have. And also, the German General Riedezel, um, you might say, was more of a Carleton person than a Burgoyne person. So there was um, some issues there. Uh, yes? Just a comment on, on the gentleman's uh, question. I think uh, wars are a lot easier to analyze after they finish <laughs> when they're happening, right? Because 
think of modern armies today, Afghanistan, Vietnam, Ukraine, we're seeing modern armies uh, facing very unexpected events. Yeah. Uh, okay, so one more thing. There was a, a gentleman named Philip Skeen, who's the commissary on the, on the attack to Bennington. And he, he's the person behind Skeensboro, or today's White Hall, OK? Um, he was telling Burgoyne and the British, because he was actually over in Britain meeting with the king, everything that the king needed to know, which was faulty information, that <laughs> there was more loyalists in this area, and that they would all, they all just wanted the king to show up before they'd say, yeah, we're not into this patriot thing anymore. We're ready to go. So the, and Skeen also was leveraging the British to build a road to his settlement. So that was another reason. Your question. Yep. Um, you said at the outset that the, um, there were Germans and as well as British troops on the way to Bennington. Mm -hmm. I had read a while back that uh, Burgoyne did not want to send British troops to Bennington. He wanted Germans. He wanted other people to do the, the fight. He wanted them to remain with him. Yep. So the, the, go ahead. Yeah, the British troops are more valuable. So as the British, as the British army marches south from Canada, the right wing of the British army is the British troops. The left wing of the army is the German troops. So anything that occurs on the left is for the Germans to take care of. Anything that would happen on the right would be for the British to take care of. So that's one reason why the Germans were sent. Um, What else? What was the other part of that question? Well, that was, was interesting. Also, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Burgoyne was part of the attack in 1776. And he was real annoyed at the fact that Carlton did not make a real attempt to take take on the road. Yeah. Which, of course, was very well defended then. Yeah. So he had a bee in his bonnet about going back the next year and doing it his way. That's right. Even though there's a flaw in that whole strategy that their line of supply from Canada to down to Albany was problematic, to say the least. So he had to subsist on what whatever he could pick up along the way, which wasn't adequate. Yeah. So, so the most important object for the British that was in their way for the British to get to Albany was Fort Ticonderoga. And after Burgoyne took Fort Ticonderoga in 77, mm -hmm. and when King George got word of the defeat, he said, I have beat them. I have beat all the Americans. That's how important Ticonderoga was. And then on the American side, they were so upset that the Americans didn't have a battle at Fort Ticonderoga the Americans would court-martial the two generals involved, yep. Schuyler and uh, St. Ledger. If anybody else would like to ask some questions, Bob, if you'll stick around for a few minutes. But we're all, I don't know if you have places yep. to go. Thank, Thank you. you. So uh, before we leave, uh, we can't give Bob a mug of Ethan Allen, because as he pointed out, Ethan was a prisoner uh, for a <laughs> at the time. So we do have a mug of of the homestead, since oh, yeah. he is here on the homestead. Yeah. And Bob came all the way from Bennington uh, today to be with us. Yeah. Now, I, I have to also <laughs> our mug maker, Bob Compton uh, from Bristol, is back here. And he has a little box with a mug of Colonel Stark and Seth Warner. And I was thinking, boy, it would be nice to put us on our shelves. But Bob, I think you should uh, leave those with our speaker here for having come all the way up from Bennington today. So, by the way, if you have uh, friends, family members who love history, consider a unique gift of one of our mugs, which we have quite a collection of. And uh, Bob, you did mention Ethan's two books, The Narrative and, um, and, and Reason the Only Oracle of Man, which we do have here. Somebody I was talking to about that earlier, they said that they were very interested in and getting a copy of uh, Reason, the Only Oracle of Man. That is a difficult book to read. It's kind of, the, the logic is a little circuitous, uh, but it is definitely worth reading. We have a little, I guess it's like a 14-page booklet that was put together by the late Michael McKnight, who gave a talk here back, I think it was in 2010. And it's a summary. There's like one page for every chapter of 
of the Reason Book. So if you want to read the Reason Book, having that as a guide, it's a tremendous little guide. And that little booklet you will not find on Amazon because we're the only place that sells that. And, uh, <laughs> Michael's widow allowed us, gave us permission to keep printing those. So it's a great little uh, uh, resource if you're interested in learning a little bit about Ethan's progressive thinking. Uh, out those 100, I mentioned we had 152 talks. I'll bet you 140 of them have been by men, right? <laughs> and that's because men have written the history of, right, uh, naturally. But next month, we're going to try to start to uh, even the score a little bit. We have Sky Macurius, who's going to talk about women in colonial America. I think the third Sunday in September, I don't know if that's around the 18th or so, uh, if you're on our mailing list, you'll get notices about that. So, again, thank you for coming today. And uh, I hope that you'll take a few minutes to check out the gift shop on your way out. So, all right, take care. Everybody.